Welcome once again to Dialogue on Public Issues. I'm John Chowning with Campbellsville University. And today I'm very pleased to be interviewing Dr. Matthew Sleeth uh, with an organization called Blessed Earth. Dr. Sleeth, welcome. It's great to be with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you and I have been acquainted for several years and you've been here before, but some of our audience may not be familiar with who you are and your organization. Well, thank you for asking. I uh, uh, am a father mm. and a grandfather and married to uh, Nancy for almost 40 years. Um, and uh, was not a Christian for the majority of my life. In the, uh, my middle to late 40s, a uh, number of bad things happened uh, and uh, got me wondering uh, what the meaning of life was. Mm. Uh, there were things that had to do with evil. Um, my, uh, I was stalked by a patient. I was an emergency room doctor. Um, my wife's uh, brother drowned in front of my children, and uh, the culmination was uh, on a September day in the fall, my next door neighbor called me up and said, could I help her get her son from school? His father was in the first plane to hit the Twin Towers in New York. Mm. And I woke up to the fact that there was evil on the planet. I had been a humanist, scientifically based. I said, if you can't see it, measure it, and reproduce it, I don't have any interest in it. Um, but I felt that evil was real and palpable. Uh, and if evil was there, what was there on the other side? Uh, I went looking and reading, and eventually one day picked up a Bible. Uh, the good news is that my parents named me Matthew and not Numbers. <laughs> and I started in the mm -hmm. book of Matthew and I met Christ there. And that has changed everything in my life and in my family's life. We have all become believers and followers in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so that is the defining uh, identity for me is that I'm a follower of Christ. Amen. Now, if I recall from prior conversations and visits, it was a Gideon Bible? It was, that, it was a Gideon's Bible. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know you were allowed to take it. I just stole it. <laughs> and uh, I, they've told me I've, I'm forgiven. Yeah, I, <laughs> that, I think so. That's the I, point. I, I, tell, I have shared that with some of my get friends that are in Gideon's here mm -hmm. locally. Uh, we have very strong Gideon's camp here in Campbellsville. I have shared that story with them. Uh, about your, your coming to Christ through the uh, finding a Gideon Bible. I am forever grateful mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to probably at some point talk about my latest book, but I tip my hat uh, to the original Gideons mm -hmm. and those who follow them. Absolutely. So. Now you uh, became involved then uh, in, in what we would call the creation care movement. That was the reason you first came to Campbellsville University years uh, prior. What is cr the, the concept of creation care? How did you get involved in that particular movement? Uh, that in, and uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, is it becoming more widespread in the Christian community? Sure. Let me see if I can answer. There's several questions sure. there. But uh, creation care, uh, first of all, um, we believe that uh, the earth was created. It's mm -hmm. not an accident. Uh, that was created by a loving and all-powerful God uh, and that we are called to be stewards of that resource. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not, creation isn't something to be worshipped, right. <laughs> uh, put up on a pedestal, but it is a reflection of its creator uh, and therefore has beauty and meaning and magnificence of its own. And uh, that as we steward this and, and take care of creation, um, we are, are doing what God put us on this earth to do originally. The first uh, working orders, if you will, to Adam in Genesis 2.15 were to dress and keep or protect and care for mm -hmm. uh, creation. And so uh, that's, that doesn't mean that you have to uh, never take a shower and only eat uh, bean sprouts. Uh, but it means that each of us in the place that we are are called to uh, be stewards of creation and to give thanks for mm -hmm. all the blessings uh, that God has given us. 
To, to some in the evangelical community in particular, they may resist that message in the context of, well, we're to be about kingdom work, we're to be about uh, missions work, bringing people to Christ. Uh, and and in, in some would even say that God gave us the resources to use at our pleasure and to advance uh, uh, our, our style of life, et cetera. Uh, how would you respond to that? And I know, I know the creation care movement gets an interesting response from some within the church. Well, I, I believe uh, that uh, it, it, the best thing to do is an analogy. If I were to lend you my car mm -hmm. uh, and uh, say, John, take, take my car for a year or, or whatever, and I'm going to come and, and get it back from you, I'm guessing, knowing you and the kind of person you are, that when I picked that car up at the end of the year, you would have at least run it through the car wash and, and the tank would probably be full. And you would do that out of respect to me. Now, you may have used that car and I didn't tell you how many miles to put on it, mm -hmm. but you'd take care of it. It's the same thing with uh, the natural resources. Yes, we're to use them. Uh, but we are, are not to uh, abuse them, mm -hmm. uh, per se. And if, if I were to look at a couple of the triumphs of creation care in the United States, when I was a child, uh, the bald eagle was something I had never seen. Mm -hmm. uh, they were on the way out, uh, becoming extinct. We changed chemicals we used and behaviors mm -hmm. that we had, and there's 100,000 mm -hmm. uh, uh, bald eagles in, in, in North America now. Um, and, and so if we had continued on that path, we wouldn't even have our, have our nation's symbol mm -hmm. left. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of wise stewardship and thinking about things, not just grabbing everything that we can. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of conservation, stewardship, Correct. rather than plundering Correct. Uh, what God has given us. Yes, and we can see uh, in perhaps in other areas of the world where things have been plundered or mm -hmm. destroyed uh, and uh, the poverty that results, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere uh, is Haiti. Mm. It is the most deforested. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere. The second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere is Honduras. It's the second most deforested. Mm. Is there a pattern that's right. emerging there? And, and uh, there is. So as we take care of God's natural resources, those natural resources take care of us. Now, uh, one of the things you've done uh, since this change and you uh, left the medical field as far as the active practice of uh, emergency medicine, mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, launched an organization called Blessed Earth. What's the mission of the organization and some of the initiatives that Blessed Earth is uh, undertaking? Uh, Blessed Earth's uh, mission is to advance stewardship of creation and uh, steward, uh, that includes stewardship of our time, um, our talents, our, our, our money, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but in particular, we've been uh, interested in time, and so I'm here at Campbellsville, and the chapel that I gave uh, was on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people wouldn't consider that creation care, right. and yet God does because all of the um, uh, laws about taking care of land and stewardship of it in the Old Testament fall out under the sabbatical mm -hmm. laws, it's mm -hmm. called. Um, so we try to, to teach about taking care of one of the most valuable resources that we have, which is, is time. And uh, by honoring a, a Sabbath, as I told the students today, um, I don't believe that Sabbath keeping is a condition of getting into heaven. It's just the condition the heaven is in if you get there. And it's nice to have a taste of that beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so those are some of the things we've worked on. We. Uh, are ending up a five-year study in North Carolina with 2,000 pastors on uh, the effects of Sabbath keeping. That group initially about 9% were keeping a Sabbath. It's closer to 50% mm -hmm. now. And uh, the final numbers aren't crunched, but I will tell you that there's a positive correlation between keeping the Sabbath and mental and spiritual health. Mm. 
Now, you uh, have a new book coming out. Uh, tell us about that, Reforesting the Faith. Uh, let's, let's talk about that book sure. a Ref little bit. Reforesting Faith uh, is, is a book about the significance of trees in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people today have never had a sermon on trees in right. the Bible. And, uh, but I point out that Spurgeon preached on it all the time, and, uh, and I have a 140-year-old uh, Thomas Nelson King James Study Bible that has 20 pages just on the trees in it. Uh, every major character in Scripture has a tree associated with them, mm -hmm. and every major theologic event in the Bible has a tree marking the spot. It's the way God wrote the Bible. And, uh, and the church has gotten away from that. There's no biblical reason to go away. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote this book to try to reintroduce that conversation mm -hmm. into the church. Now, in mid-April, that book will be available from, obviously, uh, Amazon. And, Amazon, uh, CBD. Noble, and CBD, and CBD yes. and other mm -hmm. uh, publish, uh, or bookstores around the Wherever you can buy wherever. a book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, should be available. Uh, why should people read it? In, in terms of uh, why should believers in particular read it? Uh, uh, the first reason is that God loves trees. Okay. Genesis 2.9 says that trees are beautiful in, in God's sight, pleasant mm -hmm. in His sight. That's God's aesthetic value, not mine. So mm -hmm. we ought to care about what God cares about. Sure. The average most comfortable chair in a, in a home points at what today? A tree. A television. Well, yeah. A television. Yeah. Um, God's throne in heaven faces a tree. Mm. Um, and it's, if you want to know more about God, you'd have to look at the trees in the Bible. Mm. Uh, it's a tree on the first page of the Bible, first Psalm, first page of the New Testament, and last. Christ died on a tree, and it's the only thing that can kill him. Uh, and so if you want to know more about God, <laughs> you're going to have to know more about the trees in the Bible. Now, why do you think, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you have a, the 150-plus-year-old the Thomas Nelson Bible that has uh, 150, I'm, I'm sorry, 20 pages of notes about uh, trees and, uh, and so on. And, and Spurgeon preached about, had numerous sermons that mm -hmm. had the uh, tree, about trees. Yet, uh, in one setting uh, here on campus, there were only three people in the crowd, or a pretty good number of students and, and others that had ever heard a sermon on a tree, about a tree. Why? Why have we removed the tree from the Bible and from the faith? I, I believe that we are moving into, uh, or have moved into, uh, what's called a theology of dualism. Mm -hmm. Uh, in that created matter is bad and um, only spiritual things are good. Uh, this is a heresy. <laughs> uh, it's a heresy that the church dealt with early on in the, in the first and second century. Uh, and it's one that we've moved back into. And I, I am surprised by the number of churches that I go into and I preach where not even a ray of God's light is allowed into the church. There's no longer flowers in the front, no trees, no sunlight, uh, no anything. We are, in essence, pushing the creation outside. Uh, Romans 1 tells us that if we've been for a walk in the woods, we're without excuse for knowing God. Mm. Um, and so, excuse me, so one of the reasons I think that we should know about this is because there are many people who love the creation but have never connected that to the Creator. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it's an evangelism tool, if you will, to go and tell somebody, hey, you love being out in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, in the Bible, it says the trees clap their hands when God comes back to judge the world. Do you want to know why? Or do you, you want to know why the only thing that could kill Jesus is a tree? Uh, I think it opens a, a, a dialogue between us and, and non-Christians and gives us a common point of interest that's biblical that I can talk about my faith. Mm -hmm. So what, what is the end result from this book that you hope is, that, that catches, I hope there's, that happens? Yes, I hope there's two. Uh, one is that I hope that we uh, 
put creation back into uh, the Bible where it's supposed to be, um, back into our theology. And the second is um, that I hope that we're able to expand our evangelism uh, and uh, through, through talking about creation. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, other books you've written recently, tell us about those. Uh, 24 6 mm -hmm. uh, was the last one before that. Um, thanks to you and many other schools and, and churches, it's been uh, successful. It's in its 14th printing mm. uh, now. And uh, it's, it's been out uh, six years, something like that. And it's amazing the number of letters mm -hmm. I get uh, uh, from people who say, I, I instituted this in my life. Mm -hmm. It's really changed. Uh, not only my life, but my understanding of God and my relationship with God, it's grown it. I have yet to get a letter that says it hasn't worked for me and or I'm really sorry that I took it up. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten one of those. Mm -hmm. So, you, you shared earlier about your, your son following uh, the Sabbath and, and, and both in medical school and, and now even in his practice. You feel comfortable sharing about sure. that? Uh, my, my children became Christians when they were in high school mm -hmm. and we started keeping the Sabbath as a new Christian who was simply going on the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's how I met Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when I, I remember when I read through the New Testament, then I started in Genesis, came through, and in Exodus I found the Ten Commandments. There was no asterisk beside uh, the Sabbath commandment that said no longer of any use. Mm. And so our family started keeping a Sabbath. My kids kept it in high school, in college, uh, and in medical school. I, I bragged my son finished first in his class at UK Med. Uh, he kept it in residency. He is a missions doctor at Tenwick Hospital in Kenya, and he still keeps the Sabbath. Uh, it's, the cost of that is high. Mm -hmm. When he's not on duty, people die. Uh, but if he worked seven days a week, I think he'd be home in about two months and that'd be the end of his career as a missions uh, doctor. Mm -hmm. So it's essential for him uh, just to reconnect with God. There's a place in scripture where Jesus' disciples come up to him and they're saying, what about my student loans? And what, what about mm -hmm. work on, and that sort of thing. And Jesus gives this advice, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and God's righteousness and all the other stuff will come in behind it. And I have found that Christ is true in that advice that when I, when I have a Sabbath and I'm seeking God first, all the other stuff falls in behind it and goes a little bit better. So are you suggesting that if the Christians of the world, of our country specifically, starting with our country, if we would adhere to the Sabbath observance, uh, that a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the pressure, a lot of the social pressures, a lot of the uh, emotional issues uh, would dissipate, would go away, would uh, maybe some of the addictions we have, uh, uh, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just asking the question, would a lot of that disappear? I, or at least we would handle it better? I think we would. Uh, D.L. Moody, uh, if your listeners, I'm sure mm -hmm. many of them know of the great accomplishments for mm -hmm. the kingdom uh, Moody made. And Moody was a, a big fan of the Sabbath. And Moody predicted that if, uh, if we lost the Sabbath, um, we would uh, lose the church, and if we lost the church, we'd lose the family, and if we lost all that, we'd mm -hmm. lose the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm concerned about where we're going as a nation and the state of our families, and uh, I believe that if God's given us a prescription, if you will, for how to do life better, we ought to, we ought to follow that at least. Um, I would tell anybody, you try Sabbath for a year, and if it's no good, uh, you let me know. <laughs> no one's contacted me yet, and yet I know thousands and thousands of people have uh, come to keep the Sabbath through that book 24-6. Mm -hmm. 
to, to a pastor uh, or other church leader that might be watching or listening uh, to this interview and who is struggling him himself uh, or herself uh, with this issue and, and I'm being busy and pressured and finding time to rest and recuperate and spend time with the Lord and then that person dealing with a Sunday school class or with a, a congregation of people who are rushed and busy and so forth, how does that leader deal with this issue? How do they contend with members, their own family or church members or class members? What do they say to them when they are pulled and stretched and when their kids have uh, sports activities or social activities on Sunday or, or whenever? Well, I believe, um, first of all, uh, S Sabbath doesn't have to be on a Sunday. Right. Uh, I'm traveling and preaching most Sundays and we have to move uh, mine. And I think if a pastor says uh, Friday or mm -hmm. Monday is my day uh, with the Lord uh, and is consistent with that, uh, that the church will support that. I know mm -hmm. enough pastors who's done that right. to know that the church supports it. I think a lot of pastors simply have trouble and in the experience of working with thousands of pastors, I know if that pastor gets up on Sunday and says, I need your help. Mm -hmm. I'm overwhelmed. I need a Sabbath. You need a <coughs> Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, and that church uh, tackles that together. Some great things are going to happen. Don't expect it to happen the first Sunday or the <laughs> second even. Uh, we have a website, sabbathliving.org, and we have a film on there of a family that tried Sabbath. They said it was terrible the first uh, month or two. Um, that family are, uh, have become huge Sabbath keepers. They're missionaries in, in China now. Um, uh, and so be humble about this. Uh, one of the things that I forget to do, and yet every time I do do it, something wonderful happens, is get on my knees mm. and pray to the Lord for help. Mm -hmm. And I would say if you're overwhelmed, get on your knees and ask God for help. And, uh, and, and, and reassure yourself that God's rest is more powerful than the human's work. Mm -hmm. Two parents who mm -hmm. have children and, and they want their children to be engaged. They're concerned about their children getting caught up in illicit activities as they grow up. They want their children to be involved, to be independent, et cetera. How do they keep them involved but yet observe the Sabbath? What would you say to those parents? Well, I am the father of two right. uh, children who've done well. Um, both of my children graduated first in their college class and my daughter's married to a, a minister. She also is in Africa in the, mm -hmm. in the missions field with her husband at an orphanage. Um, uh, the most important thing for a parent to uh, make sure that their kid gets is a belief in God. Mm -hmm. And when my children saw that Sabbath came first, Sabbath not as a rule-keeping mm -hmm. thing, right. but Sabbath as a relationship with the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew that that's what we valued, and children are, I believe, far more affected by what you do than what you say, mm -hmm. unless what you say is what you do. And so they saw that that came first in, in my life, uh, uh, and and my children are believers, and, and uh, you know, I have, a, I have a little granddaughter now who says the whole first psalm before she goes to bed, and she's a two-year-old, you know. <laughs> uh, they're being brought up in those ways of the Lord, too. We are not told in the Bible uh, to fit in. We are told that we're people apart. Mm -hmm. The word holy uh, means set apart, kadosh. Um, the word holy shows up in the Bible in Genesis and it is only used with Sabbath in con conjunction with Sabbath for a couple, chap or a couple of books out of the Bible really. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we're not told to fit in, we're told to uh, be holy. And, uh, and it is better to teach a child a lesson when it's inexpensive. My, ch my children had to learn the lesson of planning their day and their week getting their work done 
uh, on Saturday because they weren't going to be able to do homework on Sunday. And that lesson was, was so much easier to mm -hmm. teach when they were younger. And all the lessons fell in behind it, I think. You, know, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't go with somebody who uh, is dangerous or doesn't love the Lord, etc. As you said, this is not a legalism. This is not being taught or talked about as a legalism. Not, it, not it, at all. It, if, you, if you're worried about what you're not doing, right. uh, you, you've got it wrong. Sabbath should be something you look forward to. The Jews called Sabbath the Sabbath bride. It was almost a thing of romance mm -hmm. and beauty. Um, uh, Sabbath is something I look forward to, not mm -hmm. something I ever, ever dread. We're out of time. Oh, it went fast. Well, thank you so much. We wish you the very best and God's continued blessings. And he's using you, obviously, uh, in a powerful way. And we uh, pray for you and wish you the very best and uh, success with this book and future books. Thank you, John. Thanks for being with us. Dr. Matthew Sleeth with Blessed Earth. This is John Chowney thanking our audience for being with us for Dialogue on Public Issues. Mm -hmm.